Let me begin. I hate introductory remarks, I really do. I wish the guy would just get to the point. <laughs> the greatest speech that Lincoln ever gave was not the Gettysburg Address. I'll take nothing away from that fantastic speech, but it was his second inaugural address. And he got in trouble with the New York Times. That's how I know it was a good speech. <laughs> in this address that was supposed to be spiking the ball over the Union victory of the Confederates, he took a different tone, a very somber one. And I, for one, cannot imagine what was on that man's shoulders. And instead of delivering an address that would give his plan to rebuild the nation, instead of giving a sermon, I mean a message about the great victory and we put those Southerners in their place, he grieved like a father that had children that had killed each other. They accused him of preaching a sermon. I hope I will be accused of that at the end of this hour. He said, if we could first know where we are and whither we are tending, we could then better judge what to do and how to do it. I am not qualified as these other speakers are, I'm sorry. If you're looking for political science, I feel like I'm challenging Betty Crocker to a bake-off here. <laughs> but I do believe that there are two things this conference had better accomplish. We'd better learn where we are and what we should do. Now, isn't it amazing how Abraham Lincoln so clearly mirrored the words in 1 Chronicle chapter 12, verse 32 of the sons of Issachar, who understood the times and what Israel should do. Now Lincoln's heartache in that message where he described slavery and the judgment of God and, the, and that God's ways are just in all his ways. I'm going to say something from the very beginning that some of you are going to disagree with. You're not going to like me after that, and I'm prepared for that. As you can see, I am so uh, vulnerable to people's opinion of me. <laughs> we should never have permitted gay marriage to be legalized in the United States of America. No. Oh, I'm hateful and I'm all that. You have to understand, I spent 10 years at the University of California at Berkeley winning atheists and communists to Christ. That's what I did. I'm an evangelist. I win the lost. We recently did a tent crusade 45 minutes from here. And in that crusade, on the final night, the attendance was just under 5,000 people in a 2,500 seat tent. I'm Latin, uh, so it reminded me of when my family went to the drive-in. But in that meeting, the unsaved attended. They were invited and they came, look at me. Drug addicts came, atheists came, transgenders came. So the first sacred cow, and I love to kill sacred cows, Brother Barton mentioned Fort Worth. Uh, I'm a meat eater. Man, I'm, I'm just all over the map here today, right? Political, dietary. But the fact is, if you, if you hear my heart, I love to kill sacred cows because they make the most delicious hamburgers. <laughs> and
And one of the sacred cows that we have is that we don't realize that we were in worse shape before the pandemic than after as a church. People think, oh, it was evil that we were locked down. No, the evil was before. And the evil that we were in is when the devil seduced an entire generation to go after members instead of disciples. And we didn't correct false doctrine. It became fashionable to believe that it was unloving and judgmental to coincide with 60% of the New Testament. Over half of the New Testament is dealing with imbalance and correcting false doctrine. Paul's letters to the Corinthians are a, God gave the Corinthians every Christian childhood disease so that we might have those letters. And they were written for our power and our help. The Bible tells us to shut down the mouth of those that teach false doctrine. Now today, I can tell you that the most insidious, disgusting, and pitiful speech I ever heard in my life was the last one that Biden gave. I've never heard anything more despicable. I can't believe that anyone with an IQ above an eggplant <laughs> could not see how evil and vile and disgusting every word he said was. Uh, I, I didn't want to beat around the bush on that. <laughs> but we've got to look at ourselves for a moment. The devil didn't steal America. The church gave it away. And, and if we're going to begin with quoting Charles Finney, he said it. He said, if there's anything wrong in the poli political system, it is the pulpit that is to blame. And we have... have Listen, the fact that I could be judged and criticized and rejected for pointing out imbalance, the reason I know that the stress of the pandemic has lifted is the church is reverting to her old foolish ways. Before the pandemic, we could not criticize any speaker, any music group, that would draw a crowd. If they drew a crowd, we're gonna leave it alone. There is a built-in. That's why I knew when I started doing 10 Crusades, if I wanted my critics to get off my back, I had to get a crowd. And the Bible told us that not everything that would draw a crowd would be right. And not every speaker that drew a small group should be ignored. The power of the book of Timothy that Paul wrote is so intense, so emotional. For me, it's the most emotional writings that Paul ever did. And in his parting words to his son in the Lord, he says, I want to warn you that the contaminated crowd is coming. When we read 2 Timothy 4, it says the day will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But according to their own lust, they will heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. Now, we read that wrong. We thought that the teachers had the itching ears. The audience had the itching ears. The audience had it. And thank you for putting the owner's manual up on the screen. The next point that Paul made in this, he said, you're going to have to face the fact that telling the truth at one point in the church will be unpopular. We know it's unpopular in the world, but it's also unpopular in the church. Now let's go back to this amazing presentation by David Barton. How did all these elections happen? They all happened before the pandemic. This insidious George Soros, Bill Gates, this network of Globius, Devos, all of that. All of that, the teachers union, all of the tentacles of this monster were laid in place long before the pandemic. The pandemic gave them the open door to set the monster, release the kraken, if you will. That's what did it. But the church was looking the other way. 
I'm getting members. I've got lots of people to come into my church. I've got an incredible congregation. I'm adored and loved. You know, there was a, a David McKenna, Dr. David McKenna, who was the president of Gordon Conwell University Theological Seminary, and at one time the leader of InterVarsity Christian Fellowship, wrote a wonderful book called The Fire in the Fireplace. And he, he said this, so I, so I won't look so radical, I'm going to quote him. A congregation will elevate a pastor to superstar status if, in return, he will keep the demands of God off of their back. Where do we lose it? Why, where do we lose all these local elections? Where did we lose it? We lost it because we quit quoting the Bible in the pulpit, teaching the people the power of the blood, the rights of the believer, the inherent need to repent of sin and be born again. Now to add insult to injury, before you clap, to add insult to injury, you need to listen to me. Night after night after night, I preach to a tent full of gangsters, drug addicts, prostitutes, homeless people. Why? Because we go and get them. Is that a condemning of you? No, that's not even the point. The point is that when I stand up, there is not one word borrowed from a fortune cookie. There is not one syllable added from something that Anthony Robbins might have said. When you can't tell in the modern church, the modern church names, half of them sound like marijuana dispensaries. There's this inherent sense that we've got nothing to say to America. And we've got everything to say. And I'm going to stand here and tell you, I get up there, the biker is watching me, the atheist is watching me, the drug addict is watching me, and I tell them that he came and he was born of a virgin, he was God incarnate, he was the word, he went to the cross, he died, and by his blood your sins are forgiven. And if you are born again, you must transfer from your life to his life. And they come running to God.